afternoon and uh, welcome to Grand Rounds today. Uh, please remember to sign the attendance record. Please remember to fill out the program evaluations and uh, if you have any ideas in regards to future topics or future speakers, the CME committee would be appreciative of those ideas. Uh, today I have the pleasure of uh, actually reintroducing Dr. Selden Spencer. Uh, Dr. Spencer is a board certified neurologist and also certified uh, as a polysomnographer and neurosynologist. Uh, he is a, a, a frequent uh, and excellent contributor to Grand Rounds and he's here today to uh, update us on bad stroke and the five P's and uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Spencer. Great. Thank you. Sure. Well good afternoon and uh, Okay, we've got the sound on, everything's good. Is Sharon here by any man, or is Sharon Elric somewhere here? All right, okay. I wanted to talk to her before this talk, but now I have to talk to her during the talk, I guess. But at any rate, so um, the, ba the bad stroke in the five Ps is kind of a little uh, pedagogical trick to get you here, so I hope you're thinking about what the five Ps are, and we'll talk about them as we go through. But they are relevant to stroke and how stroke turns out. And I wanted to do this talk because we are doing things at Mary Greeley with regards to stroke care, many of which you're probably already aware of. You know, we have an ACT team to try and trigger uh, acute and urgent care of people that have stroke in the hospital. Um, and there are more things coming, uh, many of which uh, relate to radiology. And there are things out in the literature that you probably have heard about and that we'll talk about and we'll see how we can apply them to Mary Greeley. Um, and unfortunately, I have uh, a lot of other interesting things pertaining to stroke that I'm going to delve into as we go along. I have to say that the objectives as outlined are pretty lame and uh, Hopefully the talk will be a little bit better than the objectives, which I, I suspect you can address already. Okay, now another option is that you can just focus on acronyms, and so if you can sit there and tell me how Mr. Clean and Chad's crested all aspects of stroke doubt in Aruba, it's as easy as ABCD2, you can probably leave the talk because you probably know what I'm going to talk about here. But these are just various studies and have acronyms attached to them that are designed to confuse, but uh, it's okay. We'll go on, and I will start with a clinical vignette, and I have a couple of objectives that I want to talk about it. So this is a gentleman I met, uh, actually as an outpatient. He's a 56-year-old farmer. He had 20 years of pretty good blood pressure control, and he awoke and found that he had trouble putting the cap on his toothpaste. His right hand was just not working quite right. And so he went and had breakfast and had trouble buttering the bread with his right hand. And then he went out to the barn and he hitched up a hitch to his truck and took something to another town and came back to his farm and unhitched it and had trouble with the hitch. And finally, several hours later, went to the bank and the teller said, you can't write your name. There's something wrong with your right hand. Why don't you go get some help? So this is several hours later, and he goes to the emergency room. So now you're all sitting there and say, well, my God, if we just had him run to the hospital right away upon awakening and get TPA, he would have been better. And of course, you know, we have a big controversy about wake-up strokes, and as it stands now, you do not intervene acutely with a wake-up stroke because you don't know when the stroke really occurred, although that's a subject of controversy and things will be changing as time goes on. But what I really wanted to get to is here he finally went to the emergency, he came to the hospital, he's getting great care, and he gets worse. He came in with his right hand not working very well, and he left the hospital several days later hemiplegic, can't use the right side of his body. He got worse under our care. So the point being that he then goes to rehab, he recovers, but the message, and I, this is just the imaging carried out, which is on the day one that he came in, this is an MRI image showing an injury in the posterior limb of the internal capsule. Unfortunate place because it affects fibers more so than out on the mm, surface of the brain. And then, of course, a couple days later, it's a bigger area. And again, so two points that I want to make. Stroke is a prolonged process. We are so obsessed with the idea of stroke strike, acute, occlusion, boom, everything's done. A lot more things are happening in stroke, many of which we don't know how to affect at this point. 
The second point is that we are obsessed right now with the idea that you got to open the pipes. It's all about recanalization. And the point I want to make is you need to kind of constantly keep thinking about how can we reperfuse this area. Yes, opening the pipe may get more blood into the area, but in fact that may make matters worse. And so it's uh, a little bit complicated. Keep your eye on the ball, which is how can we get more blood into this area one way or another. Okay, so now the traditional outline of stroke is to talk about epidemiology. And this is the only thing I'm going to say about, well, I, that's not true. I'll say several things about it. But listen, we're still kind of hobbled with the idea that stroke is a clinical phenomenon. That is, a person has hemiparesis, and we can see that. What we really don't deal with is all the subclinical stuff that happens to the brain, these small injuries to the brain. And that's not in our epidemiology. Uh, and somewhere we're going to have to deal with it. Now we're going to spend much of the talk about talking about the physiology of a stroke and the five P's, and it's not as hard as it sounds, but it'll get there. And very briefly, I'm going to talk about hemorrhagic stroke. Most of this is about ischemic dry strokes. So here are the numbers, and of course, we focus on the 800,000 strokes per year. Clinical strokes, again, subclinical, silent strokes, microbleeds, we don't talk about them, but they are an issue. And while it's not a leading cause of death, maybe one out of every 20 dies, certainly the ischemic strokes mainly lead to disability. And this is the terrorizing thing for all of our patients. They, nobody wants a stroke. Nobody wants to be in a wheelchair or have to have somebody take care of their toileting for them. Interestingly, in the United States, stroke is declining, but it's increasing in the world. And uh, I just kind of throw this up, and as one person said, whoa, what's wrong with China and Russia? I mean, they <laughs> I think it's mainly cigarette smoking, but uh, you can see in the spectrum of things, uh, the United States is pretty good, but not as good as Europe or some areas like Australia. So that's all. Now, I'm going to spend a little while on this, and this is, of course, a, uh, a terribly threatening uh, table that came from... Um, either USC or US UCLA several years ago, and it's from experimental data, and I don't know that it's necessarily true, but it served its purpose, which is to get us very excited about the amount of time that the brain has to survive without circulation. And so you look at how many neurons are lost, how many synapses, how much fiber, and over what period of time, and you know, geez, one minute of not getting blood and I lose 1.9 million, shoot, I didn't know I had that many neurons to begin with, but you know, it's a pretty bad deal and it gets worse and worse as you look at that, and what is the net result of looking at that? You hyperventilate, you start getting pretty excited about this. Now, this is around the hospital and this is a very good innovation, innovation uh, for many reasons. Um, and I can tell you there's been a lot of iterations through the stroke field to try and find some little mnemonic to get people excited about stroke and to get urgent care. And this has a virtue for several reasons, one of which it's short, fast. Second is it focuses on just a couple clinical features. Let's just say speech, arm, face. Three things that are going to be readily apparent to a person. Now the real virtue is this focus is on the anterior circulation. So as I showed you, maybe 90% of strokes are uh, ischemic or dry. And of that 90%, maybe a third are in the anterior circulation. That is the carotid middle cerebral artery. And those are the ones you want to get at for two reasons. One is you can get at. And second, uh, if you don't, the person is really devastated by the results. Um, so I'm very happy about that, and uh, we all should be attuned to the idea of uh, mild facial weakness, mild right arm weakness, or speech difficulty. So here's your five P's, and I'm going to beat these to death a little bit, but it's easy for you to just think about them. Somebody's had a stroke, well, what's going on with their pump? That is their heart. What's going on with their pipes? The arteries going to the brain. brain. What is going on with the penumbra? And we'll talk about that. And then mixing these two things, the pressure and perfusion, 
I already mentioned reperfusing is key, and this is just trying to get at the idea how can we get blood into the air area, and then the really woolly part that uh, gets me a little bit romantic about precision medicine in the future is what's going on in the tissue that's being damaged. So here's my short and sloppy on the pump issues, which is basically 20% of the ischemic strokes are felt to be embolic, and quite often that's related to the heart, um, of which the rhythm problems and valvular problems are something that we pay attention to. But also, in the context of the acute stroke, you really have to have optimal cardiac output. And anything that might impair cardiac output is going to jeopardize your recovery and the, your ability to tolerate a stroke. And so now I'm going to spend a couple slides just talking about the rhythm issue. And you all had a peripheral exposure to this. This is the idea that if you have atrial fibrillation, you're at risk for stroke. And so there's a way of scoring how likely it is for you to have a stroke if you have an atrial rhythm problem. And I know there's a fancier way of saying CHADS, but this is easier for me to remember. So the congestive heart failure, hypertension, age, diabetes, and then prior stroke or TIA, you get a value for all of that. And you can see that if your score is zero, you have very low risk. If it's over zero, one, two, on up, you might want to consider using a, a novel oral anticoagulant or warfarin. An example, so here this person has a score of zero, his risk is about 2% per annum, and uh, there's your little graph to go with it, and if you happen to be in the Tehran Arrhythmia Clinic, this is how it would look. I don't know how I found that, but anyway, that's, that's where, there it is. Um, and of course, this is the better version, the Chad's Basque version, and what it really focuses on is the low end and trying to see if you can get more people onto anticoagulants based on a more specific age codification and sex arrangement. So that's trying to prevent the stroke based on the heart. Now we're going to talk about penumbra. Okay, so you have that nice little plug there. You have all that gooey dead brain right there. But there's all this tissue surrounding it which is vulnerable. This is the scenario you want. You can't do anything about the core, but you don't want it to get bigger. You want it to get reperfused and that penumbra shrink up and that's all you're left with. Unfortunately, you can go the other way. You don't get any blood in the area and instead of the core staying small, it gets bigger and bigger and you have a big chunk of brain that's dead. So again, you don't want that core to get bigger and bigger from the onset of your care. Whatever you can do to keep the core fixed and, the and salvage the penumbra, save the penumbra is what you want to do. So again, this is my first introduction to the idea that you can get blood from somewhere else than just focusing on the canal here, is that you have an occlusion and you do have other collateral ways of getting blood to that penumbra. So right now, state of the art is we open the pipes, we do so with TPA, and the other is mechanical thrombectomy. These are the things that have been introduced over the this particularly the latter one in the last year or so. And uh, I'll come back to that, but I want to talk about pipes. And what I want to disabuse you of is the idea that the brain is invested with uh, various sizes of PVC. It's not that way. I think it's better to look upon pipes in the brain, the arteries and arterioles, as being very in size of pipes like this or organ pipes. And so we have different blood vessels and different pathologies to consider when we're thinking about strokes. Now I know I'm moving away from the dramatic, big, fast stroke that we have to think about, but to consider the whole sphere of stroke problems, I'll, I'll just highlight things with the leptomeningeal arteries, for instance. You probably have heard of people having microbleeds or small, silent strokes. And that's a function of these uh, curious blood vessels on the surface of our brain that penetrate in and are vulnerable to amyloid deposition and cause problems and rupture on that basis. You don't see amyloid deposition in the big carotids down here. You see the traditional atherosclerosis down there. 
just to keep it in mind that different pipes have different pathologies. And so if you have your large carotid, it's got a huge thick muscular wall, that creates its own problems. If you have the arterioles, they're very thin and you start to worry about the blood-brain barrier and the leptomeningeals, as I mentioned. Now these collaterals are almost down to the capillary level and they have a whole science and physiology about them that are uh, bewildering. But the big pipes are what we're focused on by and large now and the, the, uh, we are made with this wonderful uh, redundant circulation such that you could occlude this carotid here and you would have circulation from other venues. And that's great. So when you get into a little distally, you have a big chunk of brain that's vulnerable. The patient that I showed you, his occlusion was probably in here and he had damage to uh, several of the lenticulostriate vessels. So when you're in this condition, you include that artery, but here is your core and here is your penumbra. And so we're going to try to find some way to alleviate that occlusion, recanalize, hoping that we can reperfuse and salvage all this area. So here's another case. This is a 67-year-old man, sudden onset of confusion and abnormal language after a meal, evening meal. <coughs> he literally got up from the dinner, went to a bathroom, and came out, was all goofy. And uh, here he is in the emergency room. He's been on meds for depression and aspirin, and I'm sitting in the room with him, or not sitting, but standing and thinking, well, did he just get an overdose, or what the heck's going on? Um, he does have atrial flutter, um, and his CHAD score was 1, so he was just treated with aspirin. On his exam was very difficult, and uh, nobody, I guess it gives me a job or something to do, because things are not easy. Um, there was absolutely no asymmetry, no face, no arm, no leg weakness, but his speech was garbled and goofed up, and the best I could come up with an NIH score of 5. Every cubicle in the ER has an NIH stroke, stroke score, and the nurses are very skilled at trying to put that together. Um, I had pretty much decided we were going to treat him. Uh, Dr. Sosnowski saved my tail down the line on this, but uh, even though there is an argument that you should not treat somebody with an NIH stroke scale of 5, that's too good, they're too healthy. Uh, and uh, so we did administer the uh, TPA within 50 minutes, but from the onset of his stroke and damage, um, it was over two hours. Now, is Sharon here? Still hasn't got here. Anyway, she's not going to make it. Okay, well, Sharon <coughs> is our go-to person here at Mary Greeley, and I want to direct you to her. Uh, she's doing a very good job of monitoring every stroke that comes into this hospital and if a TPA is an option, how quickly we do it because there is a national average or an objective of 40 minutes to door to needle. And as I pointed out here, gee, that's great, but what happens about the hour before that, right? And the family did a good job. They said, Dad is not talking right. Within 15 minutes, they decided to get him to the hospital and the emergency room did a good job of getting him worked up too. Um, but then this is the details on this gentleman. You all can see this arrow, right? It's pointing to a little dot there. And Dr. Sosnowski called over the virtual radiology report saying he has an included artery. And uh, I'd already decided to give the TPA and so that was just confirmation. But you can see the subtlety of this whole process uh, can really trip you up, um, but that was a good thing. The following day after receiving TPA, everything is open in the circulation, but he does have the damage to the tissue here out in the cortex. So we talk about TPA briefly. I'm not going to hopefully beat this to death, but the idea is in the 90s, although I would live through all this and I remember the emergency room was not real wild about TPA to start with because it can cause hemorrhage and there can be hemorrhagic transformations. But it was well documented that if you gave him TPA, you were less likely to have a disability, you were likely to have a better outcome as far as stroke scale and this is all the old literature that's out there. And it hasn't been challenged. Just to, for your familiarity, NIH stroke scale is as follows. 
as you can tell, if you have a person with impaired consciousness or impaired language, it is tough. It's an observational thing, and uh, I wouldn't overblow the uh, sensitivity of this study, but it is the only tool we have. And it says down here, really, if they're really good, less than four, you don't want to give them TPA. I don't know about that. And there's arguments to say that if the person even has recovered, and it's more of a TIA, or there's some evidence of some change on the CT, they might be a candidate. That's not dogma yet, and we still follow these different rules. What are we talking about a disability scale? I think everybody, just for kicks, you're looking here at a modified ranking scale, and what that shows is that it's pretty crude. You know, either you're dead or you're perfectly fine, and then there's these little variations in between that just have something to do with walking. So it's a very crude study, but yet is the key indicator for um, how your stroke turned out. All right, so what happened with this gentleman? He was in the hospital for a uh, little over a week, and by the end he was answering. His verbal skills had improved, as you can read. But because of the stroke, he's now a CHADS 2, and or CHADS 4, and so he's now on warfarin. So, summary, IVTPA to any ischemic stroke, wherever it may be, the clot buster idea, but now is the mechanical thrombectomy of large vessels. And just before we get too excited, before you get into that, you need to know all about the TIKI scores. No, you don't. There's Sharon. Uh, this is Sharon. She is all about stroke and has all kinds of credentials. You want to say something? talk. You don't. <laughs> um, I just want to thank everybody for all the care they've done with all of our stroke um, patients th thus far. Dr. Spencer's been awesome in learning all about the new things coming up with stroke, particularly all of the mechanical things that we're starting to do right now, and it's an, it's an exciting time in stroke care, actually. So yeah, it is. So you got a face to identify with anything pertaining to stroke. Yep. Good. Thank, thank you, you, Sharon. Thank Back to the, oh, really? Oh, okay. Well, thanks for coming down. Um, so anyway, now we're going to move on to uh, thrombectomy, and this is now 2014-15. If anyone came up with a great mnemonic, or I'm sorry, acronym for a study, it's Mr. Clean, a multi-centered, randomized clinical trial of endovascular treatment of acute ischemic stroke in the Netherlands. Mr. Clean. And these are the results which show that the modified Rankin scale is better if you go in and pull the clot out of the artery. Again, not all arteries, anterior circulation, carotid, middle cerebral. There are many things to say about this study that are negative, and I'm not going to do that, uh, because everybody jumped on the bandwagon. There's all kinds of studies from Canada, Australia, United States, Spain, showing that if you have a large vessel occlusion, in the anterior, remember that's about 30% of the ischemic strokes, pulling that clot out, the person does better. I will say something negative about it. The, the, one of the things is, you remember we said this whole thing about clinical phenomenon. In the Mr. Clean study, they operated, they pulled clots out of people that were completely normal. All right? So they came in with some kind of clinical symptoms of stroke. They did the studies. The artery is occluded, but the person is normal, and they go in and pull the clot out anyway. Guess what? The person turned out okay. You know, it's, it's a little bit crazy, but that's where we are, and it is relevant to Mary Greeley because we got to think about what we're going to do here, because as it stands right now, we do not have anybody that will do an embolectomy for anterior circulation strokes, which represent 30% of ischemic strokes. So one of the things that you will see on the CT scan reports re pertaining to stroke is the aspect score. And I'm going to just talk about this. This is from Alberta, and it's also an acronym that I can't remember perfectly. But the idea is you just try to identify all the zebra stripes in the brain on a CT scan, and each zebra stripe it deserves a score or a check or a one. So if you can see the caudate, line of the caudate, that gives you a 1. If you can see the insular rim, that gives you a 1. And we know if the aspect score is greater than 7, the person may do pretty well, and they'll benefit from treatment. 
If the aspect score is less than 7 or 6, maybe they won't do so well. And uh, so it's something we can do here to decide who might be able to go on for embolectomy or not. Some pictures of it that don't show up terribly well. But again, the idea that uh, if you can't see those ribbons, there's swelling going on, you probably should get out. So what are we going to do about embolectomy? Because on a national level, it's an argument about whether you should skip aims. You know, you got somebody in the ambulance and they got a pretty bad stroke, maybe they should be wheeling it over to Iowa City. You think it may be an anterior circulation stroke. Um, as it stands now, the state of the art, and I think Sharon and our committee is comfortable with this, they will come to aims to get TPA at a minimum and then we can evaluate. So the old memnotic drip and ship, you know, this is what we used to get from Fort Dodge and Jefferson here. They would administer the TPA locally and send them on down. Or you can be a mothership where you can do everything. Or you can have a Batmobile trip. What is a Batmobile trip? This is what's going on in Houston where you have a CT scanner in the ambulance. The patient is moved from the apartment or wherever into the ambulance. There is a video hook up with the neurologist or whomever, and you get your CT, you look at the CT, you look at the patient, you administer the TPA in the ambulance. Boom. All like that. So there's about four of these, and they, uh, are, they show up. They're very dramatic at the meetings when they show up. So anyway, keep that in mind. That m I don't think it's applicable to our environment. We do not have the volume to, or the a proximity with which to uh, use this. So let's move on to uh, a couple, well, probably about five or ten minutes of talking about carotid disease. Um, here's a 73-year-old farmer who's trying to tighten the tra tractor hitch. I don't know. This is all one weekend. You know, these are people that I was dealing with over one weekend. And um, he uh, hit his head and he staggered and he felt like his legs were giving out. He caught himself, he was surrounded by a bunch of people, but he just didn't feel right, and people said he was slurring his speech. He was fine in about five minutes, but they said, you need to, you really look bad, you need to go there. Now, here's, you know, the usual diagnostic thing. This guy's had all kinds of neck procedure. Maybe he just tweaked his neck and had a little spinal cord thing. Uh, he has a history of vertigo that gets treated. Maybe that just acted up, but he was adamant this did not feel like his typical vertigo. So, bless the heart of the, uh, emergency room doctors and the family, they leaned on him and you come into the hospital with the diagnosis of TIA. First thing to come from this case is, was this a TIA? Does anybody feel comfortable with that? It wasn't just the face, it wasn't just the arm, uh, but something weird happened. And so maybe it was a TIA. And so I saw him and you know we evaluate him with the APCT score with the idea that it's a TIA. And that determines what we're going to do with this fellow. So here's his, t his CT scan on admission. And the usual workup, of course, is to do the echocardia and the carotid studies. And uh, lo and behold, um, he did have accelerated, accelerated flow through the carotid, ipsilateral to, no, it wasn't ipsilateral. But anyway, he had a, a carotid artery disease enough that uh, it warranted attention. But in truth, on the MRI, he had a stroke. Now, things get very messy because where this stroke occurred is not in the distribution of the carotid artery. It's in the anterior choroidal artery. But who cares? I mean, he had a little stroke. He's got a bad artery. We better fix it, right? Are we all good with that? Maybe. Anyway, this is the ABCD score from a presumed TIA that actually was a small stroke that's now asymptomatic. Um, and just based on age, blood pressure, clinical features, focal weakness he did not have, speech impairment, maybe, duration, very short, and diabetes, no. Anyway, we generate a little score. And this is a valuable tool. Again, you'll see it down in the emergency room. They're using this tool to try and guide them in caring for a patient. I have bitter memories of TIAs in the emergency room that I could not convince to come into the hospital and receive attention who come back then several days later with a stroke. This is an article, a recent article from the New England Journal emphasizing this. Again, we know if they have a high ABCD score, they're likely to have a stroke. 
But what this article really purports to show, and it's not shown necessarily in these graphs, is you get them into stroke care, your primary care doctor, your neurologist or whoever, and get them of some religion, you can prevent the stroke. All right? So realizing this is a big deal is the gist of this article. All right. So what about carotid artery disease? A little trip down memory lane. You got to know the difference between symptomatic carotids and asymptomatic carotids. You know, you have the little vehicles going around checking whether you got uh, arterial collusion or in your legs or wherever, and then uh, people chase that. But it's asymptomatic. I'm talking about TIAs and strokes being symptomatic. And it's a little trip down memory lane here because way back in the 80s, several very good studies showed if you have a bad artery and you're having TIAs, you better fix it or you go on to a big stroke. But here's the main signature slide. <clears throat> if you're symptomatic, yeah, you want to get involved because things are going to turn out bad. This is a natural history of symptomatic and an asymptomatic arteries. Asymptomatic, not so much. Not so much. It's just a little blip on the screen. But through the 90s, they kind of beat this to the death in the United States and said, yes, you must operate on asymptomatic arteries if they are greater than 75%. The problem there is if you are familiar with ultrasound, and if there's radiology and want to correct me on this, that's fine, but it's very, very subjective. And I think you're much better off saying, man, this is a bad artery, or, yeah, this artery is okay. You know, say if it's greater than 90%, then maybe it's an issue. But otherwise, um, and that's what they did, and that's not what they did in this study. They picked this arbitrary 75% occlusion, um, or even higher than that, 60 to 99% stenosis, and operated on them and showed that they turned out better. So this started then almost a decade or two. This is a European trial showing the same thing, operating on asymptomatic arteries had better outcomes. The problem that we have seen over the last 10 to 20 years is that medical therapy actually helps asymptomatic arteries and reduces the risk of stroke. And so we're dealing with a moving target. So we got done with doing surgery. Well, maybe you're better off if you do a stent or surgery. Well, that didn't altogether turn out. It's still very controversial. But don't lose sight of the fact that medical therapy steadily has gotten better through the 90s, through the 2000s, such that the risk goes down with an asymptomatic artery. The natural history has changed. Right now, CREST 2 is trying to determine whether a person with a TIA does better with medical therapy or with stenting or endarterectomy. We only got two centers nearby, Mayo and Sioux Falls. Iowa City is not involved in it. But if you do have a patient with an asymptomatic artery and they're asking a lot of questions, maybe this is an opportunity for them to uh, uh, look into it in more detail and get some very good expert care at these two facilities. So here's a case. Yeah, I'm going to end here. This is my patient. Um, got to know him in 2002, totally asymptomatic. I think it was a 70% stenosis bilaterally. And we just followed him along. And of course, the next time around in, well, 2009, everything was occluded. Well, nothing happened in 2009. I still see him every year. Uh, he's asymptomatic. He's 87, plays best shot golf anytime the weather permits. And this is his uh, circulation. He's got great vertebrals. He's got a nice uh, basilar artery has no carotids, no carotids. So just a word to the wise that uh, you have to individualize. You have to be a humble. I would not screen. Try to avoid that. If you like, use antiplatelet drugs. But if you do have symptomatic things, you do CPAs and thrombectomies and risk factors. Now, OK, so the rest of the talk is going to get a little bit woolly about uh, sciencey things here on the the fringe. And uh, so what about going through the back door here to take care of the stroke? Collaterals are very tiny pipes, about 400 miles of pipes in the brain. You can see them all wiggling around there. And some of them are well-known uh, connections. And you can do things with the CT scan to demonstrate how good or bad the collateral circulation is. 
Here's some examples. Good collaterals. This guy occluded here. This is a CT, uh, a CT uh, contrasted CT, and you can see the artery is occluded, but he's got lots of blood flow over there. And I'm sorry this is not on the same side, but I'm, here it's occluded, and there's nothing happening. Nothing. Not very much at all. You're not going to reperfuse this through the collaterals. And they are genetic. This is mouse data. This mouse has terrible collaterals. He doesn't have any connections. This one has great connections. You can see them all through there. And we've identified it. And so this gives you a window on personalized medicine, big data, future of medicine. Would it be nice to see somebody coming in the emergency room, you know their genes, you know they have collaterals, maybe you don't want to be too aggressive about recanalization or TPA or something like that. Back to the leptomeningeals, just to remind you that's another focus of stroke and damage to the brain. Again, it can hemorrhage or it can be ischemic. And just this is a passing nod to blood-brain barriers and the a neurovascular unit gets very woolly and very confusing what who's controlling who at this point um, but this is the type of patient that I see they come in nobody has ever had a stroke but there's all this damage to the brain that is clearly ischemic and this is not showing up in the st statistics okay so the last couple P's on the pressure and perfusion the only thing that we really want, I'm not going to go wild on this because this is an issue. They come in, what do we want to do with the blood pressure? It's always the same thing. And to me, uh, what I learned in residency is still true. If they are not peeing blood and not hemorrhaging in their retina, leave the blood pressure alone. Okay? And uh, we have seeded the idea that maybe if the blood pressure is 220 over 140, you ought to do something. And I'm okay with that, but try to tread gently because the brain has no control of the um, perfusion pressure in the brain because it loses autoregulation. Normally, it doesn't matter what the pressure is. The brain is going to regulate what the perfusion is at a value that is happy for the brain. If you have damage to the tissue, it's just going to respond to whatever the blood pressure is doing. And that may be a good thing, may not be a, may be a bad thing. And there's more to be said about that, as there is more to be said about pathobiology. Now, you look at this and you say, oh, well, this is useless. Um, but if you have a stroke, there is swelling. If you have a stroke, there's very bizarre immune things happening. And likewise, the tissue is doing things that will determine the outcome and I want to give a nod to Ulrich Dernergal, partly because I really like his name. This is a great name, and this is the first picture of the long pattern of stroke that I tried to emphasize in the first patient I showed you. So here you go. Somebody comes into a stroke, they got metabolic syndrome, they've been trying to keep their blood pressure under control and diabetes, and they have a stroke. And all these things happen. Sure, there's some things acutely happen with the cells. They get excited, the cell wall breaks down, and they depolarize, and they spit out radicals. But there's also this inflammatory reaction the brain has. There's swelling. Endogenous processes go on. And this goes on for minutes, hours, days. And uh, net result is how much cells die, right? So where the heck do you start in this whole process? Can you just focus on apoptosis, that program cell death? Can you give somebody a drug in the emergency room that would prevent the cell death in the brain and try to work on these other issues? Do you focus on trying to prevent uh, inflammatory responses? So right now, even as we speak, uh, we use this drug, natalizumab, for multiple sclerosis. The purpose of this drug is it's a monoclonal antibody to prevent uh, microglia and white cells getting into the tissue of the brain and doing damage. This is in phase three trial uh, to an acute stroke to prevent inflammatory cells going into the brain and, and creating thrombosis. I, I'm creating inflammation and subsequent thrombosis. Um, focus on, there's trials trying to focus on these elements of inflammation to improve stroke outcome and using antibiotics one way or another 
and even there was a recent article just saying somebody coming in with acute stroke, if their neutrophils are already high, they don't turn out well with TPA. It's kind of interesting. So I'm not going to beat this to death. All I'm going to show you is they got all these little circles over here, and they kind of influence all these circles over here. The point being that if you have inflammation, you're going to have thrombosis. We know that, right? And to the extent that we can affect that, we might affect the outcome of a stroke. And believe me, there's a lot of interest and effort in that regard. Okay, so now we're going to sprint to the finish. This is all I'm going to say about aneurysms, almost all. There's a very nice study now and consensus. And of course, if you've got somebody with an aneurysm, you can send them my way, or you can try to use this little table, which you can find under that terminology, which says this favors surgery or favors conservative management. Very useful. I was really impressed, and unfortunately this is not a very good reference, this is a pretty good reference, that if somebody survives a subarachnoid hemorrhage, remember half the people die before they get to the emergency room. Once they get to the emergency room, another half die before they leave the emergency room. And so the remaining quarter of the patients, if they're handled very well, can turn out really well. And that's what's the news out there. And the thing key was uh, talking about DVTs and narcotics a whole realm, and of course we don't do that here at Mary Greeley Medical Center um, to any great extent we ship them. But what about ABMs? This is Aruba, a randomized study of unruptured brain ABMs. You basically leave them alone. That's the bottom line there, so that's the message. Okay, we're going to end with this. Two, three, four, five. I told you I'd have a video, didn't I? A little video, okay. So anyway, here's what about weird stuff. So here is a uh, Cleveland Clinic study, and you can re you read the text, which is if you take the gut bacteria from a young mouse and put it in a sterilized old mouse and then give the old mouse a stroke, they do just as well as a young mouse. Okay? If you take gut bacteria from an old mouse and put it in a sterilized young mouse and uh, give the young mouse a stroke, they have a bad stroke just like an old person. So there's a role for the gut bacteria in stroke. has to do with, well, there's molecules. And guess who wrote this article? Ulrich Dernigal. Uh, again, nice guy. He's uh, really creative. In Britain, they're very big on now using uh, nitroglycerin for acute stroke. Um, I know that's passe as far as chest pain here in, in, uh, in the States, I think, but uh, it may be coming to Mary Greeley Medical Center in management of acute stroke. Um, atorvastatin turns out to prevent the cell death program, so using atorvastatin and lipid-lowering drugs acutely in stroke is very reasonable and is done, uh, not just to lower the cholesterol level, and then there's lots of other drugs that are being tested to try and um, reduce the damage of the acute stroke. So in summary, we went over the whole thing about time and TPA and the evolution of a stroke. Uh, if we do have that 20%, 30% large vessel occlusion anteriorly, we want to look at thrombectomy. But in truth, we ought to keep thinking about how we reperfuse that tissue apart from opening that artery, because it's not always a winner. You can open that artery, and the tiki store not turn out very well, and the person actually hemorrhage, and I can give you text and verse of cases that have turned out badly going to the University of Iowa to get uh, recanalized and hemorrhaging. Um, carotid artery disease, be calm about that. Uh, stress the five P's when you're dealing with the patient, chads, and that type of thing. Individualized. So that's it. Now, you have the opportunity to ask me any burning questions you have. Oh, David, I knew you'd come through on this. Oh, no, he's not. He's leaving. <laughs> Got nothing to say. Oh, did I? Okay. Oh, okay, very good. Any questions? Any Thoughts, concerns. So the key thing here, relevant. Yeah. I a I actually, on the ACAS study, the asymptomatic carotid artery stenosis, the 60 to 99 was, I think, more for men. 
and so there were gender differences. So it's yes. not recommended for women. And I just right. wanted to kind of point that out because you know we always think of men and women as being same, but these studies actually showed that asymptomatic stenosis only treated in men had right. you know beneficial outcome. And I right. think what was also interesting was that when they look at the symptomatic carotid stenosis, the higher grade stenosis men you know, they did well, but the symptomatic, 60 to 79% didn't do as well. So mm -hmm. then you're like, okay, asymptomatic men with middle grade stenosis do well, that we can determine, but not the symptomatic people. Right. So that's, I think that's, that's something that always I wonder about what, you know, why it showed, what it showed. But again, right. the gender differences, I thought they were kind of interesting how men and women differ. No, I, I, I remember meeting, um, Dr. Toole at Wake Forest, who was the spearhead of that trial, and he was determined to prove that treating asymptomatic carotids, he was not going to take no for an answer on that. But anyway. All right. Well, thank you very much. Have a good day.